Welcome to the Zeph Report. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Merry Christmas. Uh, yeah, it's December 25th. It's about 7.07 a.m. Mountain Time. Uh, that would make it about 9.07 Eastern Time. And uh, every other time, you'll, you'll just have to figure that out yourselves. Uh, but it's good to be with you. Um, I'm going to have to make an adjustment here on my... Uh, Charles, I'm going to have to make a slight adjustment here. I have Kanita with me. And uh, we're good to go today, but we need a slight gain. Not too much, but just, okay, that's, yeah, because I'm not really coming through that speaker. Okay, a little more gain, please. We're doing it all, all we're doing it all, actually, we're doing it the studio way today, so that's why I thought I had it nailed, but my voice needs just a little boost, and it has a little boost. There we go, how's that? Okay, very good. So, you know, out there today, I was, uh, I did a rant in the middle of the night, and um, then I had to get back to sleep because I knew I had this this uh, talk coming with Kanita. So it was like, okay, it's like a potathon today. But what was the what was the issue earlier besides just the overview of all the things that are wrong, um, that, which are incredibly wrong beyond all belief wrong, and that is. You know, this idea that Christmas is somehow, you know, Jesus wasn't born on Christmas Day, and, you know, we all know that. And Jeremiah talks about pagans, you know, decorating trees. We know that. We have read Jeremiah. We know, they dec we know pagans have been decorating trees for thousands of years or however long they've been around. And they've been around because they're there for one purpose, to oppose God. So they like to decorate trees, and they give wreaths. Symbolic of, uh, of vaginas and, and trees, symbolic of penises. So what's your point? It's a fertility thing. That's how paganism all started. Worshiping the gods of the field to give a better crop. Sacrificing little virgins so they might have more rain. You know, whatever. We understand all this. But the thing that I said uh, earlier was this. But then how foolish of the pagans to make Christmas... Uh, in one of their holy days. Because Jesus uh, opposing the pagans is a joke. God has all the power. So if I were them, I wouldn't put it uh, in their solstice uh, celebrations or whatever. But they did. Okay? Or maybe it was put there by Constantine. Or maybe it was whoever put it there. And put it, it, it stands in opposition to the paganism, and um, so they have to make all their ritual days about Jesus, opposing Jesus, of course, which is kind of ridiculous. It's like me opposing the sun. Uh, welcome, Charles Kunita, um, and and um, he is from Kunita's Ramble, and my, many of you have heard that podcast. That podcast goes out worldwide on a whenever it goes out, all the time. Welcome, sir. Hello, it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, it's good to be back, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's. I'm sorry, but I haven't really kept track of the time, but it has been a while, and I guess that's just... Yeah, it's been a while. It's how things roll, I guess it's Well, just, you know... Go ahead. Uh, you were cutting out there for just a minute, but oh. yeah, it's been it's been a while. But, you know, we go on in our walk, and, and God leads us in different directions and all that, and then we... We come back together, we speak, we rejoice, uh, we, we, we fire each other up, and we move on. And that's, that's kind of the way of the walk, you know, in this world. That's the way it is when you're, when you're a lamb. <laughs> well, I, I don't have time. He separates between, us. Yeah, I don't have time between us, really, because, uh, you know, it was like I just, uh, you were just on, the, we just talked the other day, and then we talked yesterday. And then that was like, it, it mm -hmm. still seems like, it wasn't that long ago we spoke, but it, I know it was in for certain in certain people's way of time. But in my way of time, it's everything is like you know. I talked to you yesterday, and then before that it was a yesterday again. Now we're talking again. Well, it's it, all it's all in the now, Zeth. All of it, all of our relationships with each other, with God, everything happens in that instantaneous moment that 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 between us. It's all in the spirit. That's why it seems like it was yesterday. That's why there's no separation. That's uh, why we don't know that it's been, what was it, three years, four years, five years? We don't know. We don't care. <laughs> you know, we're one. I don't, I don't, it, when we time goes by. We communicate in other ways. There are so many times when you and I have spoke on items that were almost exactly the same from our own individual perspectives. Yeah. But yeah, we didn't talk about it. We didn't know this. It's because we're one. 
Right. We didn't. It was just like the spirit was on us to say something about a certain topic that the spirit had had, you know, of the Lord had come upon us and, and given us the topic. And then we both talked about it at the mm-hmm. same time. And that happened. And two straws stir the drink a lot better. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's but but let me ask you this question. Over the years, Dasha, my dog is suddenly wanting attention. Over over the years, since you've been podcasting, what do you think mm-hmm. about the way? Well, how, how should I word this? How do you feel about the way things have gone over the last few years of your podcast? What have you noticed, if if anything, over the last few years of your podcasting? What I've noticed is a uh, general disintegration, a general distortion of uh, all the fields of human endeavor as, uh, you know, as they go. Music, philosophy, right. literature, I mean, everything. It's, it's all been distorted. There's no more, for, for, and I'm speaking of the secular world, not of, 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 of the people of God, but there's no more rhythm. There's no more beauty. There's no more originality. They've run out. They've they they're bankrupt and we can see it in every field across the board standards that we knew as children yeah. are gone everything has been undermined nations governments schools family life everything right and god has let it run he's let it run out because it began decades ago before you and i were born but uh it it picked up steam in in the 60s and in the late 50s and and uh we watched it we were a part of it, actually, as 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 youth, uh, enthralled yeah. in all in all the changes. I remember it. Uh, <laughs> God is dead. Think? The the God is dead in Time Magazine, nineteen sixty. Oh, I remember that day. Yes, I do. That I was... remember that. And even though I was a child, that struck me. There was an inner thud within me, even though I didn't know that I knew God. Mm-hmm. I didn't know any of these things, and yet. Uh, it was like that uh, kick of John the Baptist, you know, in the womb. Kind of yeah, thing. to me, it's like that. I remember that day. I, I take it back to that day that started it out. I'm thinking 1965, if I'm not mistaken. It could it have somewhere been somewhere in there. 64. And it made a real impression on me as well. It, it, really, <clears throat> it really disturbed me. And at that time, we were still um, dealing with the trauma of the, of the, you know, the murder of JFK. And then we were, you know, yes. getting ready for the murders of Bobby Kennedy and, and uh, Martin Luther King. The Vietnam War was raging mm-hmm. on. Uh, the, the whole yes. music movement started up of, uh, you know, going from an AM based thing to this FM kind of music and protest music and about the war. And then eventually activism, uh, you know, taking over school, you know, auditoriums or taking over administration buildings or whatever they were blowing stuff up, you know, the weather underground, Bill Ayers. All this stuff got going on yes. back, back then, <clears throat> and now they're running the place, these people. <laughs> well, you know, that's because it's those people and, and those who, who were in the previous generations that set all of this up. You know, this stuff didn't converge by accident. If you go back and look at how a generation was destroyed and, and, and the whole culture was pivoted into something different. It began years before. The Vietnam War was uh, perhaps the single biggest, what should I say, destructive force of that time. And that didn't start then. That was set up earlier. Ho Chi Minh was actually an agent of the OSS and the CIA during World War II. He was uh, placed in command. The CIA was actually against the French coming back, and when Truman overruled them, the CIA funded Ho Chi Minh to go to Moscow and get the training and all that he needed, and then we supplied the arms and everything through the Soviets as a proxy. Our government actually supplied weapons and leaders for both sides in the Vietnam War. It wasn't a question of a military victory. It was there simply to destroy our society, and then you bring in the music, the protest music that came in to a generation that oh, yeah. had lost its belief in the liberty, the different <clears throat> protest movements, all of these things came together and they wiped out. And remember, Kanita, remember they brought in LSD 
Timothy Leary. Yes. Psychedelic music and yes. all this stuff. When, yeah. Go ahead. And you know, when I was in the Army, Zeph, that stuff was everywhere. I never saw drugs till I got in the Army. Yeah, yeah welcome to the <laughs> There NFL. was no marijuana in Columbus, Ohio. Right. You know, there was no LSD. There was none of this stuff. I get drafted in the Army in November, and, and by the end of the month, I saw more drugs than I had ever seen in my life, and I hadn't even got out of basic training. And don't forget brilliant people like Jane Fonda posing with the North Vietnamese oh, yes. uh, while our guys are getting killed. I still killed. won't see her movies. While our guys are getting killed uh, yes. and while we're trying to be yes. earnest, we're trying to fight a war that we believe that, you know, it's just like a regular war. And yet now we're killing our own. We're, we're, it's us versus us, just like it is today, my friend. <laughs> oh, just well, like they, even, they even destroyed the camaraderie of, of, of war. You know, in World War II, right. they put a unit together, and that unit went, and they fought, and they fought until the war was over. Yeah. Okay? In Vietnam, it wasn't that way. You had an, a 13-month tour. You went over there. Your main goal was to get your butt home in some kind of reasonably good condition at the end of that 13 months. The group cohesion just simply didn't exist. You weren't one unit that went over. You were a unit that was constantly rotating and replacing. So the morale was was never there. Uh, the camaraderie, the yeah. leadership, none of these things were put in place to allow us to win. Right. It was from the very beginning, we were set up for what happened to us. And uh, we've got a whole generation of, uh, of men that are my age now that are Many of them still lost. You know, they, they never recovered from the things they did, the things they saw, or the things that were done to them. Right, and, and uh, so all this came on really fast. Again, folks, you weren't around, but I, I was a boy in the mid-'60s, and then I, uh, the first big trauma I had was seeing the footage, you know, seeing live, I'm sorry, you know, pretty much live anyway, the replay over and over of John F. Kennedy getting his head blown off. I saw Oswald get mm -hmm. shot. On live TV, me and my brother were watching because the, the school sent us home. There was no school. And so when they brought Oswald out and I'm watching, this is not a videotape. This is live. I see Jack Ruby. Yeah, I remember. St come right up into the crowd, stick his hand right up, you know, against Oswald's chest, right at the heart, professionally, by the way, like he'd done it a million times yes. before. Blow him away. Oh, it and then was a hit. It was a hit. And then, and then even law enforcement acted like they were ready for the hit. You know what I mean? They sort of like they they yes. were they were not. What scared me as a kid was how they how nonchalant it was. It was like bang. Well, they made no effort to stop him. They made nobody no, got in the way. No, nobody he came, tried to stop him at all. No, because it was planned. It was another false. Oh my God, the word false flag. Yes, and when I'm a kid, yeah. I see this, and my mother is taking us down to the the the, the drugstore. That's the only thing that's open because they had some games and stuff for, to keep us occupied while people dealt with the trauma of all this. So that was the, uh, my introduction to this whole thing. And then the next thing was, you know, the, the whole pop culture movement and anti-Vietnam mm -hmm. movement and revolutionary movement and these people taking on the whole commie thing, which is, you know, generated, like you said, from the CIA and uh, from, from the wealthy um, individuals of the earth. Uh, propagating the uh, communism and the music and the LSD. And uh, all you had to do was sell out if you're a musician into that. And you could, you know, uh, they would pay you to come up with subversive, whatever, yeah. anything subversive. And you could be famous, you know. Um, yeah. And then, you know. What I, was it? Tune out, turn on, something like that? Tune in, turn on, and drop what was out. It, Timothy Leary, he said. Yes, tune in, turn yeah, on, and tune something. in. That was. Yeah, tune in, turn on, and drop out. That's the one. But you know, Jeff, all this goes even deeper than that. This entire Cold War confrontation with communism it was all the same thing. It's a psyop. You know, when I was in the army, and, and I don't talk about my army experience much because it brings back things I don't like to speak of. Yeah, but I had a very, very high security clearance. Okay. okay? From documents that I was familiar with and people I knew, when the Cuban Missile Crisis hit, mm -hmm. there was never going to be nuclear weapons on those missiles because the Soviets didn't possess that many. The Soviets at the Cuban Missile Crisis had exactly 16 operative nuclear weapons. Uh, 
they have never had the numbers we have said they had. They probably have more now than, than they had at any time then. But the whole confrontation was set up. It was a dynamic, like, like the good versus evil kind of thing, dark and light, meant to push us into certain directions. As, and, and we became a paranoid society. And then the Vietnam War, the music, and all of this accentuated that paranoia and just broke us down as a society. Right. And that's what we see today. Yeah, and, it's and, a con- and it's all been a psyop. Yeah. All of it. Right, right. It's a continuation, folks. In case you don't know, since I've been around for these generations, too. It, all the music and all the, um, the art and all the, uh, the culture war and all this stuff, it was already raging back then. And, you th- and it's, just, it's just another version of it now. Nothing's changed. You've all been controlled. All the people perpetrating it, they're all completely under mind control. They're under soul control. This is, uh, they're worse now than before because they, they're zombies today. They don't think at all about anything. They just do what they're told. No, that's true. But, but, but it's the same movement. It, the whole, I, and, and now l- let's, let's do this, uh, Kanita. What do you think the end game is of this? Because obviously there's no, they're not going to be order out of chaos anytime soon. So what do you think they're up to? Well, I think what they're up to is uh, they're trying to bail water on the boat. The boat is sinking. And this whole idea of their new world order, this is this uh-huh. is their last stand. This is like this is like Custer calling the troops for a skirmish line, you know, because yeah. he thinks he might win with his firepower. This is what right. it is. And uh, they're trying to stir things up. People today, they call this confusion and the thunder of the nations and all of this turmoil. They call this a roar, and they think it's a roar, and they think it's something powerful is coming. But you know what? I hear God. I, I hear in my mind, in my heart, in my whole body. I hear a roar, Zeph. I hear a roar, and it's not the roar they hear. No. I hear a roar, and I hear a roar coming. Me too. And that roar is getting louder and louder. Amen. And it's coming. And, and, uh, Hallelujah. You know, people are scared. Even Christian people, they're running around, and they're wrong. We're not to be scared. We're to be joyful in all of this. Yes. God is finally acting. We're supposed to be happy, proud. God gave us the spirit of liberty and love. We're to rejoice in every phase of God himself. Yes. We're not to run around scared with our tail between our legs. We're to stand where we are. We are the ultimate dog soldier. We are tied to the living God. What he does, we do. Where he goes, we go. When he comes, my friends, we rejoice. That's it. I didn't mean to go there. I love it. Well, that's great you because know, you made the, the exact point that's very, you know, that's been in, in our Rima uh, lately, which is basically that God wants his people uh, to rejoice. We are not to lament. We are not to be sorrowful. And I, I know that I've, I haven't been perfect. I've been going back and forth, but I keep coming back to God. And it's like, oh, we all are like that. You know, and, and, and he, he shows me Revelation 18. He shows me the very verse. He goes, uh, I want you to rejoice, he says, even though the world's going to hell in a handbasket because you've been avenged. All the blood that's been spilled, all the innocent blood, all the horrible things that have been done, everything is, is, is going to be uh, adjudicated and settled, right? Amen. I mean, that's really what Amen. we're all I get, about. I get so excited when I think about it. <laughs> in one fell swoop, and, and, and yet one hour... In an hour, in a short period of time, it will all be settled. And that's, I think, the roar of thunder that you're hearing. You're, you're hearing that, that, that mm-hmm. thunder that God is actually, when this whole thing collapses, if it, if it go, I, you know, I, I don't, it could, it could happen any matter of ways. But I think what they're, they're starting to feel, and, I, and this is what I, I really know this, God is intertwined in everything. And they've just, for thousands of years, they seem to have put that, on the back burner, like they don't believe that God can see them behind closed doors or see them in their whatever, in their little clubs and their societies and so forth. But God is involved in all of it and is even having control of their minds and their words and the letters they write and the and the edicts that they that they put forth. And God is actually influencing all of it. All they they can't get away. That's what I think. The thunder is. They just can't. The word says that. Yeah. 
the word says God laughs at their foolishness. Oh, he yeah. mocks them. You know, he, yeah. he uses them. Like we spoke of yesterday, you know, with, with, if there were no Holocaust, there would be no Israel. He uses them. What seems like trauma and stuff to us is simply yeah. c- construction. It's road construction for God, and he's about to grade, grade this place real good. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. that's what it is. Well, yeah, and, and, and all these, you know, all these um, wars and all these things, they think they're going to get somewhere. And uh, God just does what he wants to do, like you say, using them all the that's while. Right. And I think they're becoming conscious. And, and it's the same within each, within each of us. It's the same in, in like, a, yeah. like a microcosmic world. You know, we're built by destruction. We're built by crushing. You and I have both felt the hand of God when he meant to clean us up mm-hmm. in what he did. He spared nothing no. except death. He spared and, death, and barely. This church, <laughs> yes. But, but still spared, This yes. church today... Don't understand that. They've walked away from that. See, they, that's why you don't see the Word of God preached, because they've never been crushed enough to really know the Word of God. They've never no. met the living God. You meet the living God no. a lot of times. You know, they give you this man be pan be holy moly stuff. Yeah. You know, God I know what you came mean. to me with a crushing fist and a swift kick in the ass. You that's know, it. It, it wasn't always pleasant. You know, it's funny, though. All the literature that you see talks about people's testimony about how they were broken and they had nothing and they yeah. had no health and they just gave themselves to God. So please bring me back, Lord. If you bring me back, I will just be your servant on the earth. But I, you know, if I keep going like this, I'm going to die. And they talk about how God brought them back. I could be, I see these testimonies all the time and that they, uh, they became ministers of God. And then they went out and, you know, gave that testimony of how, Faith in Jesus Christ, faith in the Lord brought them back to where they could actually do some good for God on the earth and not just be a, a waste. And they talk about their brokenness and about how, uh, whatever, you know, it's a typical kind of testimony. And yet, the yes, result. Yes, it is. <laughs> but in the church, you, you know what I mean? I have that testimony. You have that testimony. We all have that testimony to a certain degree. But, but then. You know, the results we have in the Church of America, let's say, because we're both Americans, so the -hmm. Church of America, the result we have, does not measure up to those testimonies. It's like, well... Oh, no, if you went into the church and told them that God was breaking you in half, they'd tell you because you were a sinner and you were sinning and you'd have to deal with that. We're supposed to be whole, joyful, rich, all of these things, you know. Right. Yeah, they they have no clue because they don't know God. No, and they, they... you know, you've, it's torturous to sit there through their sermons and their, and their, you know, nodding and winking at the same time. <laughs> so it's, I remember once we were in this one, one famous pastor, and I could see there were two angels holding him up on, 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 you know, I could see them. I mean, they were in another dimension, but it's like they were standing next to him, one on each side, holding the guy up because he just showing me that he was like a complete lightweight, even though he's a heavy hitter on, mm-hmm. In the bookstores and the, you know what I mean, the whole, the, you know, everyone knows this guy. And uh, yet there he was being held yeah. up, you know, like. I like, know you're talking about, yeah. He couldn't stand on his own. And then Trish and I noticed that there was a guy in the choir. There's like a choir right behind the, the, the pulpit. And, then, and, and there's, there's some of them in the choir that were staring right at Trish and me. Because I, I wasn't, I thought maybe I'm paranoid. Trish is noticing it too. It's like glaring at us to get the hell out of that church. And, and you're talking about a yeah. service with 10,000 people, and they're signaling us. I'd say, Trish, are they really signaling us out? I mean, are, are we being signaled out here? You know, um, and she goes, yeah. The guy is just going off. Look at that. He's completely demonic. And then it's like we just kept on trying to get along with him. <laughs> but it was... You know, and then the Lord showed me, I mean, I've said this story before, but I've got to say it again. He showed me, he said, well, 87% of the people here are, are non-believers, but there is, you know, that 13% or so. And, um, and he showed me there was an area of the church where there are all the um, uh, wheelchairs, you know, the area for all the wheelchair people. And those were the ones that were okay, <laughs> you know. But not not completely. But it's I mean, the crippled. It's yeah. They were the ones. Yeah, it's the crippled. It's the broken. You know that that those are the ones that that's 
Christ picked out the broken. Yeah. He didn't go. Like he said, you know, you don't send a physician to those who think they are well. It's the broken and those who know they are broken. That's where Christ comes. And, and I know I've seen that in the churches. You know, I, I, I had all the training. I was a part of a uh, denomination, uh, Church of the Nazarene. I went to their Bible college, their yeah. large, and their seminary. And I saw these things uh, going on there, and, and that was when God pulled me out, because I would have probably gone right down that path. I mean, that's the mm-hmm. first thing most people do when, when God opens their eyes, is they go to the church. That's what they think they're supposed to do. Well, that's what I thought I was supposed they to do. they don't realize. Yeah, I am. Sure. We all I, do that. I learned very quickly that, um, you know, I started because I was having some prophecy, some words to give out. You know how you, when you have the Holy Spirit, you get a word for someone or a word, you know what I mean? And they look, they, every time I would utter anything, they would look at me with disdain. And they say, You're, you, you need to be quiet for a couple of years, learn how things work around here, and then you can talk. I'm like, wow. I remember that. Wow. They used to tell me to be quiet, and I couldn't do it. And they <laughs> actually tried to take me out because I didn't do that. They... uh this is what precipitated all those years of madness, but God was in it because I was, yeah, uh, I went to the seminary one day, went to a class and all of a sudden I got very sick in the class and they sent me to this hospital right around the corner. Yeah. They said I had a spider bite and there was a big welt and they prescribed a whole bunch of drugs for me and those drugs sent me on a, on in, into the darkness. Uh, I almost committed suicide. I wanted to, I was sitting there thinking of reasons to do it and finally God came upon me and I, and I ran in the bathroom and threw those pills away, but it had yeah. done its damage. It, it, it that did something in my brain where I could no longer use rational judgment. And I fell apart, went into depression and, uh, the mm-hmm. church disowned me. Everybody disowned me. They walked away. I was, uh, wow. cast out on my own with just my children. That's all I had. And, and God, and, and he led me through this, uh, wow. until he had taken away everything that needed to be taken to he had cleansed what needed to be cleansed to he had smashed what needed to be smashed. And I'm like you, Zeph, I'm a stubborn kind of guy. Yeah. So it took, uh, takes a it lot took to, several hits. a lot to bring you down, huh? <laughs> it did. Yeah. It took a lot, you know, I, I, but, uh, but you know, when he did that, when he rebuilt me, my what a new life, what a new, what a renewal. It was, it was as if I had never existed before. I didn't care about those years that were lost. All I could think about was the joy and the life and the renewal and the visions yeah. that he had set to me that I understood where I was, who I was, what I was, and why I was. And the That's rest awesome. didn't matter. Isn't that great when you know? And, and he added so much to my life. Yeah. Yes, it is. Well, well, you know, well, and, and I'm a wealthy man. I make twenty eight thousand dollars a year, but I have more wealth than anybody I know. And today I'll have twenty or thirty people in my little six hundred square foot trailer and we will have a great time. We'll love each other. There's warmth and healing and, that's nice. and all of that gave back to me. You wow, know, that's it, awesome. it's it's just you know Are you hearing I, this you out know, there? People say, so. Aren't you lonely? Are you, you know, lonely? I, I've lived a life you know, my my life with God is different than most, and, and I don't talk about this a lot, but maybe I should here. I've lived a life of celibacy with the living God for 30-some years, mm-hmm. and that brings an intimacy into your life. So those of you that are lonely out there, my friends, you have a partner that will be everything that your soul and spirit could ever need. He will supply all of those things. I don't feel lonely. Sure, every now and then I'd like to have someone to talk to, but I'd get it probably wind up being an argument, so I'm just as well off. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't get lonely. I don't, I don't sit up here, wake up, and feel like I'm alone. I'm never alone, and I'm fully conscious of that fact. I speak with him all day long, in the van, in the house. It doesn't matter where I'm at. People look at me and they think I'm nuts because I just, I'm concentrating on God. I forget they're around sometimes. And they'll say, oh, what'd you say? And I'll say, oh, well, nothing, you know. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's, it becomes a way of life, uh, that intimacy. Yeah, it's, That's it's, what Christ came to bring us. He didn't come to bring us three hours a week and hell raising the rest of it. He came to bring us loving, personal intimacy. And, and when you're alone, I used to hate being alone. 
I mean, I, I, I used to have to just be around people for no reason. You know what I mean? And I, and I, that's probably why I lived in a big city. I, I just needed, if I was out in the country or on the beach alone too long, I had to go around, get around people. It didn't matter whether I knew them or not. I just had to be around them. And the one thing that was really yeah. interesting is, and it became harder and harder because when you, when you make a decision, you know, that you're not going to go uh, the satanic way, uh, then it's hard to be around because those crowds of people turn into stalkers, turn into devils. You know, they're after you. Yes. So it becomes harder and harder. And then yes. you're, you're trying to like, okay, now what? And then with the Lord, it's like suddenly you not only have this friend, but he starts showing you things. Like he'd show me people from the past and he'd show me people from the future and he'd show me, I, he, he taught me how to ride a motorcycle. So, so I say, where are we going? He takes me mm -hmm. somewhere. And then I see someone from the past. And they don't recognize me. And I'm watching from the motorcycle. God's talking to me going, see what happened here? I'm like, no one would believe this little epic adventure that I've been on with you, Lord. No one would actually believe that you took me on a little drive about 10 miles away from my home to a parking lot that was an old school in, 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 up by Mulholland Drive in, in L.A. And that then, then someone I knew from the past would be walking like a zombie down the street with her father, which is odd. And then I would see the two of them, and they wouldn't see me. And he would say, you see, this is what happened to this person. You see how her father was the handler. And he would come to the hospital to deal with mm -hmm. her. And he would, uh, you know, he, they couldn't do anything without him. Then they gave her shock treatments. And then they gave her shock treatments every week. And it was like uh, the little room there where their shock treatments were given. And the, the father was always there. And now she's a zombie. Walking like, uh, and daddy's right there, shepherding her along. Mm -hmm. And I was, I hadn't. Well, God I, shows us things. This was when yeah, I was a does. boy. I was a boy in this little, you know, mm -hmm. loony bin. And, um, you know, I was there because I, I d did drugs or whatever. They, they would put rehab and, and you know, every, every, they, all the kids were in the same boat. Anyway, hadn't seen her in all that time, and uh, went to a parking lot, you know, some 10 miles away, parked for no known reason known to me, and I was just sitting there, and then this event happened in front of me. What are the odds, Kanita, on something like that happening like that? What are, what are the odds? No odds. The odds don't exist, Seth, because <laughs> yeah, what he was right. doing was he was giving you one of those, one of those moments in eternity. You know, the Bible is filled with these kind of, kind of things. It's all a part of prophecy. Prophecy doesn't always look forward. Sometimes prophecy looks backward to give you an explanation so that, so that your walk can go on the way God needs it. There are a lot of things he explains to me that I don't put on the podcast because they're simply not what I do. Uh, yeah. There are things that, that keep my walk going, that focus me in certain directions, uh -huh. uh, or that prepare me for what may be to come. Things like that, and and this is what that is. Uh, like I said, you could go in the Bible. I did a podcast once on Zechariah in chapter five, where he talked about uh, the the evil uh, being being carried away to the yeah. plains of Shinar. Okay, this was a prophecy out of the past, meant to explain mm -hmm. where the, the what, what if you would say the reinsertion, I guess, of this this evil of the of the hybrids of the entire panorama that, or, or the uh, paradigm of pre-flood world into the post-flood world. This is where it started. This was its insertion point. So he gave a prophecy of the past to explain oh. the future. And, and that happens repeatedly. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's weird because, well, the message to me was, you know, to, to understand our society. It was, it was not about this one uh -huh. woman and what happened to her. I mean, it was sad, and I prayed, you know, for yes. some kind of a good result. So th that, that happened. But, you know, it was for me to see that, the, the failure of our system, the complete, utter, and abject failure of all the people I had trusted, the complete failure of all the people that were my educators, my doctors, my mm -hmm. parents, my peers, that, see, this was like a metaphor in a way, or even an allegory to a certain extent, of all of that. That all of it, all of it, everything in the world, everything I'd experienced was nothing. 
and God is everything. He's showing me that now look at the experience we're having and look, here was your life before. You see, there you are with your puppet master and here you are a zombie. This is your life. This is what people's lives are. And now here you are today alive and breathing and on an adventure. Well, the world, be, the world builds psychosis, psychotic people, and instability. That's all they have. That's it. And, and that, that's, it, yeah. it is, that, that's what they give you. And, and, and God gives you the only wholeness of life that we can possibly know comes from there. We can't know it anywhere else. It doesn't come from school. It doesn't come from books. It doesn't come from music. Yeah. And all of these things are good in their place. But life only comes from the giver of life. Amen and it only to comes that. One way. It comes whole. That's right. And Jesus, you know, and Jesus wasn't you know, born. We don't get part of Jesus. He wasn't born on on December twenty right. fifth. He wasn't born today. <laughs> no. Who cares? You know, we I are a care. species that is commemorative. That's what we do as a species. You know, when our Lord was here on Earth, there were a couple of holidays that the Jews had that were not given by God. There was Hanukkah and the Festival of Lights. I think our Lord participated in those. I mean, there's nothing that says he did, but had he not, there would have certainly been something that, that was raised about that. You know, the, the Pharisees or something would have jumped all over him for not partaking of the holy days. So our Lord participated in those because they were cultural uh, commemorations of acts of God or, or important things within the life. Chris, I celebrate Christmas like I would celebrate Memorial Day, Labor Day, Fourth of July. It's a commemorative thing of men. I celebrate it quietly with my family. I don't. I don't have a tree. I don't put lights up all over the place. Uh, mm -hmm. But I give a lot of gifts. But if you did, I wouldn't. And, I, and we, I, we get together. But if I, if you did put lights all over the place, no, I, I, I don't judge anybody that does. I, I wouldn't. I, I don't care if you have a wreath on your door and and all kinds of phallic trees <laughs> with, with, with baubles and, and and things dangling around and light bright objects. I don't care. I, the thing is, I already know all this. Here's the important thing: mm -hmm. we're celebrating Jesus Christ birth, his advent of uh, his coming onto this earth and, and what he really mm -hmm. represents. We're commemorating and, that. And it's a, it's yeah. a doorway. It's, it's actually the door out of here, which is so interesting because most people think, well, it's, it's about life here. Well, we're, we're here for a brief flicker of a second to see what we'll do really. I think it's a test, but Jesus is the doorway out onto, you know, restoration and then beyond to, to things that are not even, Mm -hmm. We can't even comprehend they're so mind-boggling. But, you know, there's the door. You know, people concentrate too much. Well, yes, he is the door. People concentrate too much on these thing about the holiday. I, I look at holidays in the same way I look at meat offered to idols. You know, yeah. I try not to offend my brother, but I'm not going to allow anyone to, to take away from the love and freedom he has placed within me. Uh, if, if You know, yep. it, it, it's a holiday... It's, it's a day to relax and, and enjoy family, whatever you want to do. Absolutely. Those people that are complaining about it, it, it's mostly a show. They're not over there at their work showing up for an eight-hour day when nobody's there. They're not uh, sending back their holiday pay. Yeah. You know, come on, get real. If, if you really mean this, you pack your lunch and go sit outside your workplace for eight hours today. Yeah, that's right. You know? Get out there. Or if you've got holiday pay, tell your boss you don't want it. Christmas isn't right. Christmas I don't need a, that holiday pay. But Kanita, well, then I would maybe believe you a little bit more. But I don't see anybody doing that. But Kanita, Christmas is a Christmas is a uh, Zionist plot. Now you know that. <laughs> oh yeah, sure it is. Yeah. No, I mean we got. I've, I'm sorry. They own folks. all the Christmas tree farms. Didn't you know that? That's that's right. And they, it's all just. A, it's just a, a plot, just like everything else is. No, I understand. There's all this insanity about all this stuff, and I used to be kind of a you know a little bit in the beginning. I'm at the Zephyr Report. I was kind of traumatized. I was sort of dealing with suddenly awakening after I'd been awake and asleep and awake and asleep and back and forth and back and forth. And then the Lord took me and he told me to go out on the internet and I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I just said, okay, you know. And, uh, and I was a little bit, you know, I'd run into people, you know, who'd, who'd say, oh, look, they're putting trees up. And look what Jeremiah says about it, Zeph. And then I'd be parroting that, you know. And then eventually I kind of came into my own uh -huh. thoughts about it. I'm like, well, what the, what's the big deal? What, why does it matter to you so much if someone puts a Christmas tree up or not? Who cares? 
well, they're worshiping pagan gods, Zeph. No, they're not. They're celebrating Christmas. Have you ever had the Christmas spirit? You, get, you know when you feel that warm feeling toward other people? Sure. Well, isn't that oh, yeah. nice that that's what this day kind of represents? I, yeah, it I, is. I'm in the Christmas spirit, and there are people out there that want to they wanna, they wanna piss on it, you know, and, and just take me out of the Christmas spirit. And, it, you know, this is a time of forgiveness, of, you know, bonding with other people, of finding, you know, letting things go, disagreements, whatever, and just kind of coming together as best we can as crippled humanity. You know, it's one of those days uh, of the year where that, that actually happens. It's unlike, and there have been movies, you know, It's a Wonderful Life and other things about being compassionate to other people. Sure. And, and remembering the poor, remembering the widows and orphans. You know, gosh, what's wrong with that? I mean, is, are you going to take that away because it's p- pagan? It's like, is that pagan? Uh, I, as far as I know, pagan is... Uh, pretty self-oriented, you know, pretty selfish uh, religion, right? And um, that's, not the yes. way, that's not the way of Christ. It's other people. It's thinking about the ones you love. It's, it's, it's wanting to give gifts because you just want to think about that other person and if they, maybe they'd like that gift and so you, you give it to them because you just you have the joy of giving. I don't know, you know. That That's I'm, right. We're creating a, an atmosphere of joy. This is the only day of the year where we could actually say there is an atmosphere of joy. Uh, true. Even if only for an hour or two hours. But, but it is there. And that's Christ. It is Christ. real and it is tangible. And that's Christ-like because yes. you're and giving. these people that you're giving. know that about it, they, they're, they're frustrated in their walk. Right they're, on. But on their set, you know haven't gone beyond the legalistic uh, acknowledgement that God is God. You see, you have to go beyond that. Yeah. Uh, you know, God dwells in, in the darkness, and we must pass through that darkness to get to the light of God. And if you're outside that darkness, all you see is the legalism that flashes through. Mm-hmm. You must pass through into God, into the light of God. And then his light comes into you, and the darkness within you is gone, because you're of the light now. And then you quit judging all of these little things. You let people live their life, because when you have the love of God, there is liberty in that love, and you're willing to give the liberty. Yeah, you got to let people, you know, be it. It all comes in at once. You got to let people be at the level they're at, too. You know, I mean, everyone's at a different level. That's all right. This, a different part of the journey. And you have to kind of go, you know what? We're not all at the same place at the same time. So I got to cut some slack to my brother over here. My, you know, I kind of know people who are left. I know, like, this one guy. And I, he probably is going to one day get on to this I've been talking about lately. But he's, he's, he hates God. <laughs> but he was, went through this whole um, but he's a lamb, you know, we can tell he's a lamb. We know he's a lamb, right? And he's been through this whole uh, thing of get being burned by the church, and then, you know, he's got this whole thing going with God as a psychopath, and, you know, he put us here to judge us and have wrath, pour wrath out on us, and then, you know, and every time we make a mistake, he, there's the wrath again, and it's like we all have Stockholm Syndrome is what he says, you know? And I just, and I look at him and I go, I just feel this affinity with you, bro. I just really feel like, even though I can't chime in too much on his page or whatever, but I, I feel this kind of like kindred spirit with this guy who is in an all-out war against God. <laughs> but I feel closer well, to know, him. A lot of times when they're in the darkness, they, 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 they strike out. Yeah. But if he's, uh, if he's in the darkness, sure. he's heading towards God. Only the people that go to God actually get into that darkness that's around God. And these are the people who get attacked the most. And uh, yeah, the attacks yeah. always come in the dark. You know, the light always comes in the dark. Without the darkness, light has no meaning to us. It's like we have we to go must, into the we in, must experience into that, the darkness. It, we got to go into that scary place, the darkness, in order and, and take That's a right. chance with faith. You know, to, to, we have to take a leap of faith that God will be there to catch us, that we won't disappear into the darkness forever. Yeah, that's a that's kind of like a well. He must, you know, trial by yes, fire. Yes, he must be in the darkness. Zeph. If God allowed His brilliant, glorifying light just to shine, it would obliterate all of creation. We couldn't <laughs> bear it. We couldn't stand it. He must shield himself 
from his creation. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the purpose of the darkness. That's interesting. And that's also the purpose of, of, of the trip. That's the purpose of the walk. Yeah. We're called into the darkness. We're not, we're called to the light, but you have to go there to get there. You know, yeah. that's the valley of Baca, the valley of weeping. That's the way right. of life for a believer. That's Get Psalm, used to it. That's Psalm 23. It change. Well, Psalm 23, it says, the Lord will make us a table in the midst of our enemies. Okay, so the darkness for me is going out in the midst of our enemies, knowing how they feel about us, and not, not even knowing me personally, but they just say, you know how it is. And then, and then, and then going, well, mm-hmm. God made me this table. I'm going to sit here at this table and I'm going to enjoy myself. I don't care what they think. That's and right. that's always the test is that's always the, uh, there I'm surrounded by the darkness. And then I become light because I'm, I'm taking what God's given me and, uh, I'm feeling all, you know, warm and fuzzy. And every time I have that kind of attitude where, well, Lord, if you made this table for me, I don't care if they're all around making scoffing and laughing and doing whatever I'm with you. I can't lose. And what always happens is, you know, and this is just like going out in public or going to a restaurant or, you know what I mean, and going to a ball game, you know, whatever. Uh, they, they know who you are. Mm-hmm. It's, it's foolish for us to try yeah. to hide, right? Because they know who you are, right? They know who I am. Yeah. There's no oh, yeah. point, point in trying to, like, kind of like fly under the radar, right? They, they already know who you are. They just, they, whether they manifest or not, that's up to them in that moment, but they... They all could manifest at any moment where they see you and then there's, you know, 15 of them and there's one of you. A lot of times they tend to manifest because bullies run in a crowd. And so they, they tend to want to attack that. They, they see a little light moving and they want to attack it, right? Because they, they, they need to live in darkness. Yes. They want to live in the dark. So we yes. take, we take, we, okay, so we buck up. We say, okay, Lord, I got to go do this. I got to pray up. All right, well, please stay with me, Lord. And so you walk through it, and lo and behold, you see people, instead of being the big bad bullies that you thought in your mind you fantasize are going to come get you and hurt you and mess with you, instead of that, you get this, ha, 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 and they're running for the exits, yeah. where, wherever you are. They're and whimpering. There, there's, a, yeah. there's some kind of, the opposite happens. And instead of that big bad enemy out there, now comes compassion because you feel like, oh my, if only I could just reach you. And the Lord says, well, you know, the fact that you showed up here, you did reach them. But their reaction is going to be their mm-hmm. reaction. In other words, they're going to get upset. And they're going to fly off the handle. Even if it's not at you directly, they'll fly yeah. off the handle over in the corner somewhere. You hear ah! some yelling or some dropping something or someone screaming something. And it's just because the demons in them are all upset. <laughs> But you you got to learn not to be frightened. That's all. you got to learn to, to, there's nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear. You just got to. But you, sometimes you got to get in their face, too. Sometimes yeah. you got to not be afraid to get in their face and, and, sure. and use the, the living word against them. Because when you talk about a table in the presence of mine enemies, my mind also goes to Psalm 84, where I say, Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. Yep. And I'll put it right in their face. But and, and they don't like to look upon that face. No, and, and I... And they run. They, they run. They run. <laughs> they run. Boy, they run. But they don't forget it uh, when they have a lesson like that. When they no, get, they don't. They, no, they don't. They, I don't have a lot of friends. <laughs> well, no, but the thing is, is that that will be a future friend of yours. They run, but then they realize... It has it, happened that way. Just like I've run from the devil in the past. Before I had God, I, I tend not to run. I tend to be bait now. I just kind of put myself in front of them and see what they'll do. But in the past, before that, I would run and hide. And they would, oh boy, they would kick me all over the field. They'd had a field day with me, having so much fun at my trauma and, and my horror at, at all this supernatural stuff going on around me. And uh, now, of course, it's not that way. Now I can't find them. I'm like, where are you? Where'd you guys go? Yes. I'm ready. Hey, I'm ready now. I'm ready now. I want to show you something. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Anybody? People don't understand that when they start this walk. It says right in right in his word, he said, Thy life have I given thee for a prey. Yes. We're out here. We're like the rabbits and the wolves, like you talk about before. Oh yes. And and there's a balance. 
There has to be a balance, and that's the life. And it isn't until you get into the full light that you really learn about the protection of God. You are quite literally prey to all sorts of things early in your walk. It's what diverts so many people away from God. Yeah, they say, I don't want to be treated like you get, you get treated, so therefore I'm going to just follow yeah. God in my own way. And I'm like, dude, <clears throat> the treat, you, you, that, that, you know, the refusal to, to, to walk the walk, in other words, you don't want to be treated like I'm treated. I'm treated like, you know, the only reason that my walk went the way it went probably is because I was hard-headed and I wasn't listening. So I got my ass kicked. Okay, fine. That doesn't mean you have to have your ass kicked. I think that's true for most of us. <laughs> you know, because I, I, I kept thinking I was going to solve it on my own. And, uh, you know, I'm going to yeah. f- find out a reason for all this, this crazy crap going on around me. And one of these days, it's all going to make sense. Well, it, it does make sense now uh, if you look at all of life as one big spiritual battle. Then it makes sense if that, mm-hmm. because that's really what's going on. And then this whole life we agree upon together and we have our jobs and our lives. And it's, it's fine, but it's not really the real thing. That's, while that's happening, this other thing is raging along. And it's really more the real thing. And don't you find, Kadita, there are all these people, they act like they don't know what's going on when they do. Don't you think? They play pretend. They act like, oh, we have a nice little world here. Yes. But, but they know all about, you know, because I, I talk to them and, and it's like, you know everything, and you're acting like you're just a, a, a naive as a spring chicken. But you know everything, and you act like you don't know everything. What, what gives here? You, uh, 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 no, they uh, know. Uh, I, could, I could get, if I say, I could get in trouble if I say anything. Well, then you better not say anything. You better well, keep... see, that's the thing. They use fear. Yeah. Fear is, is how they control people. Uh, and if, and, and, that's that's just the opposite of, of walking with God. It, it's it's a total different dynamic, a whole different paradigm. Mm-hmm. Their reality is something that that's completely different from our reality. Uh, quite terrifying, as a matter of fact. It must be terrifying to every day if you say the wrong word or do the wrong thing, you get punished. That must be terrible. I, yes. I, mean, I would never fit in this thing like that. I, it just goes against my very nature. You know, it's not... And they say, well, they... But boy, we tried, didn't we? They, they, well, they... Uh, didn't we try to fit in, Zeph? I tried so hard to fit in. Oh, I'm sure. I tried to be the biggest creep you could ever be. I, I was slick. I, I could lie. I could do all this stuff. But I just couldn't fit in. No, they I could... Never, you, you, you could part of it, no matter could, how much I tried. You could jump all, through all their hoops, and I'm sure you did. And then you bounced off the mirror like me. You didn't go through. Yeah. Because, because God saved you. Yeah. And the thing is, is that otherwise you would have been one of them. That's probably why you have compassion for them, because, you know, you ha- had it worked out, you would have been one of them because you wanted success and people to like you. And I'm sure we all did. I would have been brutal, Zeph. You would, would have been, been so, such a mean guy. I can tell right now. You, you would have been one I of can. Satan's best totalitarian uh, honchos. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would have been brutal, uh, you, you, you would know, you would have no been like Pol Pot it, or, or you would have been like Mao Zedong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, understood. There was a lot of anger in me, a lot of anger. So yeah, I, I, I would have been, and, and and there was very little conscience. So yeah, and that that's a bad combination. Well, I think you know you've, part of the reason conscience goes is because we're forced, you know, into so many bad things when we're young that the conscience naturally just sort of, you know, eventually you just get used to lying. Eventually you just get used to... to, Well, compromise kills conscience. Yeah, you get used to stealing. You get used to fabricating evidence. Mm -hmm. You get used to uh, bearing false witness. You get used to, you know, the group think rather than individual think, where your individual mind is telling you, hey, come on, dude, you're lying. And then you get together with the group, it's like, it's cool, man. I'm, you know, part of the group. And then God breaks you in two, and then you complain about it. I, at least I complained about it. And then finally, when you finally give it all up to the Lord and you get restored, you realize, my God, Lord, you had my back the whole time. I did everything I could to completely ruin myself and ruin everything. But you saved me from the very beginning. Yeah. From the very beginning, you had my back. I didn't even know what I was doing, and you had me covered. I don't deserve it, Lord. Yeah. I did everything I could to, to... That's one of the most amazing things about God. That is, 
that yeah. even before we know, we're protected, we're watched, we're covered, even though we have no idea. There is, I, I, I could have died 50 times oh, yeah. before God reached out and grabbed a hold of me. You could have been uh, killed probably 50 know, times, and, too, by, and, by people you didn't know were out to get you. Sure, yeah. sure. It could have happened, you know, and, and all of it, I was, I was protected. I couldn't even kill myself. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it was his hand and, and his hand guides his hand. You know, I've learned to rely on his presence and his touch, his hand, his guidance. Uh, I don't, I don't base what I do upon reading the newspapers or anything else. It's strictly on the living God, where I go, what I do, uh, where I live, what I am. It's all, you, you know, and I picture I Ohio, never survive. I picture all these like foothills, hills. Do you live in the hills? Are there hills around here? Uh, I'm I'm not far away from the hills. Uh, uh, the hills are to the southeast of us a little bit uh, from Columbus. Yeah. Columbus is just out of the hills, about 30 miles east and south of town. You get into the hills. Uh, I drive to them all the time, though, and I, I have this feeling. I stop it, and park at this. The grassy hills, right? Lots of grass. Yes. I, I just see Grass this. and forests. There's a lot of trees in Ohio. A yeah. lot of water. We have a lot of streams, creeks, rivers, uh, a lot of trees. This was all forest before it got cleared for farmland. Uh, right. All through here. Uh, well, you know, when we in the flat areas, it, we, it wasn't really grassland. We've flown back to, um, when I say back from here, back you know, back east to uh, into the Midwest, and and as you look out the window of the plane, you see nothing but forest, and 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 you don't see any people, you know, anywhere. Yeah. And, then, and then you land in a city. All of a sudden, there's a city, but it's like one little dot out of the right out of the earth. And um, you know, you get there, and, and, and we went to um, Fort Wayne, Indiana, which I don't know how far that is from you, but it's it's yeah, probably about 120 miles. Oh, that's not far at all, is it? That's like going from uh, L.A. No, to... No, I drive 300, 400 miles every day, Zeph. That's nothing to me. <laughs> so Fort Wayne, Indiana, if we go there again, we, we should get together. Because we're, you know, I go we there. Should. I go there. That's to go, right up Route 33. I go down to Fort Matter Wayne. Fact, I do deliveries that are only 60 miles from there. Well, I go there because I, you know, because I've of, of the my my pursuit of audio, and they they have this gear fest every year. Sure. At Sweetwater, which also supplies lots of churches, and in fact, I've got friends who actually build church systems of huge audio, so that you get all the yeah. great audio. And I just think when they're building that system, I think, gosh, you know, I'd really love the idea of, uh, you know, real worship music, you know, and the, the, the kind of high technology that's going into these studios at the churches and all that. And, and one day this will all be solved, resolved, won't it? I mean, some will it take a lot of pain, you think, Kanita, a lot of suffering for all of us to kind of reform the churches, the, the commercial churches? Yes. Will they? Will yes. They... Yes. But I have a feeling they really want the Lord. They uh, just, they just, they, yeah. There's this thing in the way. There's a thing in the way. Well, you see, what's happened with the church, Seth, is they have wrapped themselves in an organization, and the problem with an organization is an organization becomes a life of its own, and that's actually what a corporation is. They give you a nine-digit number, like a social security number. You become a living entity. And what you what the church did when they became incorporated for the tax benefits yeah. was that they gave authority over the church to each secretary of state within every individual state. That means that the secretary of state actually can shut you down. The church board of trustees is officially and legally an organ of the state, not an organ of the church. Uh, it's there at the behest of the secretary of state. And then they went one step further with the 501c3 and got in bed with the federal government. And now the right. federal government also has authority to shut them down. And the federal government has actually began restricting what they can say from pulpits. They're not allowed to, for instance, uh, they can't endorse a presidential candidate, for instance, if the pastors seem to think that's important. They're not allowed to do that. Right. And whoever controls what you can say controls your organization. And what they found is a lot of these men... I knew them when I was in the Bible college and, and going through. A lot of these guys yeah. really do love God. They really want to do the right thing. But they're stuck inside an organization 
that actually is there to inhibit the kind of things they want to do, to stop them, to make them into a group think, a, a wing of the hive, if you would have it. And sure. that's what they've become. And they don't know how to bust out of it. And the only way they're going to bust out of it is through pain, pain and death, because right. life only comes through pain and death. Yeah, after that's, enough that's death. That's the only way it comes. Yeah, with enough chaos and death here on the, on the homeland, uh, that tends to wake people up and, and you, you, you realize that the 501c3 is nothing. Who cares if they kick you out? Who cares if they shut you down? Go do it for real. You know, walk yeah. away. Walk out to the desert. Walk out to the, to the country. Throw yourself on your face and ask the living God to forgive you for everything that you've done, Pastor. Because you've gone, you've actually, Pastor, so I assume one of you is listening, what you've done is you've actually, your whole life has been going the wrong direction. <laughs> and so now it's time to go the right direction yes. because you, but see, what I'm noticing is they all see what's coming and they don't know what to do. It's like the people in law enforcement. There's good people in law enforcement. There's a good guy heading up the FBI right now. Okay. You know, I, I, I believe he's a God-fearing man. I, I don't know. I just, I just know he's a, a real human being like there used to be in the FBI. And he can't do anything. You know, he's trying to investigate Hillary's emails no. or whatever. But he can't really do anything. He really is still hamstrung by all this. And it's going to take some kind yes, of shock. he is. I know he can't do anything. I, I understand what's happening. I watch it in horror. But it's going to take some kind of horrible shock, some destabilization, something terrible that will come because of maybe the terrorists. It is something terrible is coming, Zeb. Okay, something tell me about terrible it. for them, glorious for us. It, it is coming. You see, they, when they begin to bring it all down and try and take control, they're going to take out the church. Yeah. Those people that are thinking they're going to be raptured, those are the ones that are going to be the tribulation saints. Those are the ones that are going to initially pay the price. Most wow. of God's lambs, he's got stashed away. A few of them, like me and you, we've got big mouths and we broadcast where we're at. But most of God's lambs are hidden in the shadows. Uh, you know, I live in the shadows. I live in the cracks of society. You do too. Mm -hmm. That's where God has us. That's where we flourish. And, and by living in those places, we flourish just like a plant that comes up through the cement. We break up the things they're trying to lay down. That's some awesome. some guy, an old friend that's of mine, called, an old friend of mine, he, he, that's what he said. He says, you remind me of a weed that grows on the freeway. There's no reason for it to crack up through the, that's right. pop up through the cement. And there it is. It's, it's almost like a tree. And he goes, but that gives me hope, he said. That gives me hope. I'm like, so you see that that's guy. That's our job, Zach. A guy like that with the right stimulation would be one of us. It's just that he's really weak. See, he's really weak. Mm -hmm. And so he has to like, go well, along. Well, when this all begins to come down, there's going to be an outpouring of the Spirit uh, the way you and I and Brother Thomas especially has been talking about. Mm -hmm. That is going to come. That is coming. Some of us already feel it. Some of us already have it. But that's just the vanguard. We're here to show the light to others. That's why we're here. We're here to guide them along. I'm here to encourage, to strengthen, to teach, to restore the wounded, to heal the sick. That's my job. I'm not here as a, as a prophet. I'm not here to tell people what's coming, even if I know. But don't I'm you think all that healing is? For what's coming. But that, that healing that you do, all that, that, everything that you do, though, is prophecy. You know, I mean, if you want to look at it technically, it is prophetic. Sure it is. It's a working out of it, yes. But, but I'm not the prophet. You know, I am the, I'm, if this is a combat army, Zeph, I'm the field medic. Okay. That's what I'm you're, here to do. You're not the chaplain? Where's the chaplain? I might be the chaplain. I might even be the morale <laughs> officer, but yeah. I'm not the general. <laughs> the, that, and I'm sure of that. I like that. That's good because we need morale. We need that boost. We need that pep talk. We really do. You know, yes. and we've got some people, you mentioned Brother Thomas. You've got Govinda, we've got you, and we've got me, and then there's others out there you don't see who are reblogging, and, you know, I mean, and the word's getting out. It really is. Sure. So it's... Uh, sure. We I have... find my podcasts on all kinds of different places sometimes. Yeah. Uh, things I never heard of. Yeah, there's more and more people you know, listening and, in. And I mean, with... it, it seems that suddenly, lately, there's been a lot more people listening in, and I'm understanding, too that there's a lot more people going into the churches right now. I mean, they almost sense something's coming. 
you know, and they, 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 they're not sure mm-hmm. what to do, so they're going to church, which is fine. I mean, that's, that's good. Well, they don't be- know where to go. They don't know where else to go. That's their problem. Right, but they I mean— where, They can't really come to you or me. But they're feeling something. They're feeling something, and that's yes. good. They're, they're feeling— Yes, they are. They're feeling something. So that's why the podcasts are going up. I think the podcasts, there's also a, another group that wouldn't go to church, are coming into these podcasts because I'm watching the numbers. And suddenly it was like, you know, for a while back, you know, I mean, this is kind of ridiculous, but a few months back it was like, you know, we had like a, a million four hundred thousand listens on since 2008, let's say, just on Podbean. Now, that doesn't count all the other mm-hmm. YouTubes and this and that and all the other platforms just on that. And then all of a sudden it went like, started just going, you know, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, 1. And it just blew through 2 million the other day. And, you know, and then, and then it just left that in the dust and it's just gaining steam. I'm going, where are these people coming from? <laughs> you know, suddenly, and, and, and I, I have an answer for that. They're coming in right now because they are very worried about things. And they're frightened. Yes. Yes. And, and they want to know they are they're coming to you uh, because they want that that comfort and they want that uh, that that pep talk and they want that healing word. And they're coming to me to find out what the you know what is going on. And they're going to Brother Tom that yes. I want. I think this is going on across the board. I really do. And um, it is. It's, it's wonderful. I, I, I just hope it's enough. And in time, I don't know. Well, it's always going to be in time with God. But yeah, yeah, I'm seeing it. You know, you well, know how it is? I'm seeing it grow like this. Like it starts off like this trickle, like a, like a stream, and then it becomes Niagara Falls eventually. I'm seeing it like becoming Niagara well, Falls. Well, that's what my podcast is. <laughs> when I started on Podomatic, Zep, I was there yeah. for almost, I was there for five years, okay? Yeah. And, and I started off with very few listeners, almost none as a matter of fact. And I didn't care. I talked to the wind. God wants me to talk. I'm going to talk. I don't care. Yeah. I don't really pay much attention no. to the stats. but. I I probably got a total of 5,000 listens in all the five years I was there on Podomatic. I moved over to Spreaker, and I started doing podcasts more often and added yeah. a little music to it. But the, the same hunger is there. In, in less than six months, I've got 8,000. Wow. That, that's, that's a huge increase. It, it's almost scary for me. I, I wouldn't be able to handle the kind of listeners. Well, I'm thinking have. about I don't like. I'm, I'm thinking not about good in the spotlight. I'm better in the shadow. Well, you don't seem like in the shadows to me today. You seem like in the spotlight. But here's no. the thing. Here's the thing. I, but that's because I'm with you, and you, you help bring that out of me. I love yeah. having dialogue. You know, that brings out things that, that just sometimes don't percolate up when I'm, when I'm just by myself. Well, here's the thing. The, the speaker thing, I know that's coming on. That's very popular. We might, I've been looking at that, too, to add that on to what I have as an add-on. You know, just to because I feel that it allows a, a live broadcast, and I really like that. Yeah, I really yeah. like that. I, I get some Amen. connection in the chat room, although I can't do a lot, but uh, yeah. I like that part of it. Well, I I'm going to have to uh, look into it, and I just because here's what I'm perceiving. I perceive that that need is so great, and that people are who listen to you, who read Brother Thomas' blog. I haven't looked at the stats over there. I not that I could see them, but I have a feeling he's awfully busy as well. I think that what's happening is yes. they, they feel burned by the church. They feel, you know, they can't go there because they feel they've, you know, they want the truth. They're sick of it all. And they're finding us and they need to hear from us because they are feeling crazy, mad, like you said, maddening. Yes. And they just need to calm down. They need to, to understand the Lord's got this. And if you're with the Lord, then you've got this. You're going to, you, this is, yes. you, you can do this, people. You can do this. But it's going to be maddening for a lot of people yes. around you. They're going to be losing their minds through fear and through trauma. They are in a madness. They're, they're delusion. God's going to put delusion on their hearts. Delusion is a form of madness. Yes. And they are going mad. Quite literally, they are mad. Right. And, and sure, they will take it out on us. Sure, many of us may die. So what? <laughs> Everybody uh, dies. To die is I don't live. spend my time sitting around worried about that. I can't worry about that. You no. know, yeah, I, I worry more about the life he's given me than the death I've got to go through. You know, that's no big deal. But, uh, yeah, they're coming to us because we offer that hope. We offer something that they can grab a hold of, something that they're not getting out it's of the It's tangible. Church. The church surrendered themselves. Yeah. Yes. Well, you, what you're offering yeah, is— Yeah, we're not interested in their money or any of their stuff. We no. want to give, and that's what no. they understand. 
no, I don't want their, their money because I don't want to be, you know, I'm kind of like Donald Trump. I, I don't want to be beholden to anyone. Yeah. So I don't take any donations. But I don't blame anyone. If you do, that's fine, too. It's just for me, it's just easier yeah. that if someone gives me, you know, $10,000, right, which is, you know, over the top donation. And it, don't laugh. Things like that can happen. And they do happen all the time. So let's say this person is a, um, has a certain thing about Christmas, I'm just saying, let's say yeah. they don't like the, the, yeah, the, the holiday of mean. Christmas. And so let's say I just don't do a podcast that day on Christmas, even though I'm being called to, because I really don't want to offend my big donor because he might want to give me another 10000 You see what I'm saying? It yeah. could be very well, subtle. Well, that's the position the church is in. Yeah. Yes. It could be that's very what's subtle. That's to the church. That's how it became a – the church became an organ of the – aristocracy in the way it was set up and created because it needed funds once it was set up. The church was never supposed to have its own buildings, its own structure. The uh, church was about relationship, never about structure. But what they did was they, our Lord understood structure kills relationship. Structure becomes about structure. And all the and, teachings and Jesus did. within the structure. Jesus' teachings were all done uh, under the tree, on the mountain, you know, over, over by the stream. That's right. You know, it's, it was it was like that's right. And the apostles, when they went out, you think they had a big church building? No, they no. met in open fields. They met wherever they could. Well, with Paul, people, uh, Paul got his ass kicked. Private homes. Paul. Paul got his butt Paul kicked. Paul went to people's houses. <laughs> Paul. Paul was just yeah. trying to do what came naturally to Paul. Then he got kicked out of his. He got kicked out of his own church in Ephesus. I, I, I think that must have blown his mind. Yeah. Here he is. You know, they they threw him out. Well, see, <laughs> wow, he got a lesson. You know, for all of us, even after we're even after we're renewed in the spirit, there's still a little bit, you know, of our past life that bleeds through, and think and structures the way we think and all that. And Paul came out of of, of a religion that had an organized structure within the right, church, and I right. think Paul thought that that could be Christianized in a sense, in order to provide some some kind of refuge and, and some kind of structure in, in these new yeah. people's lives. And yeah. I think by the time of his death, he had understood the mistake he had made. No, I, know I think that. some of his last letters to Timothy uh, make that clear, that, that, yeah. that what he was trying to set up was not what actually happened. And, and I think Paul felt a great burden, almost as if he had sinned. Uh, yeah, yeah but see, that, it's, it's, so, it's, so, uh, it's so important to have his letters and have his journey so we can learn from this oh yes oh yes oh yes it is that's the journey of a man going from structure to relationship that's the whole walk that's the light of the walk that's why his books are there that's what it happened with solomon solomon walk. in the old testament it's kind of like paul in a way but different yeah, case but, but that's why his books are there yeah i mean it was good to see solomon you know there aren't any clean people that come to god zeth we all come to God in the darkness. We all come to God as wicked, wretched people. Amen to that. And that's what the Word tries to show us. But Solomon, you know, it's like, but God never took back that uh, that gift of wisdom. He kept that with Solomon. No. And uh, and Solomon spent most of his time, you know, look, looking for hot chicks, you know, <laughs> and and, uh, and and having yeah. and having nice things. Very materialistic. And he was the best at it. If he, if he had his wealth today, he would be so far. Be, he'd be he'd be beyond all the billionaires combined, and the Rothschilds and everybody else. He'd be beyond them all. Oh yeah, uh, by a lot. By a it lot. It would be hard to be Solomon, though. And how how it would be hard to stay holy. I think when you have that kind of wealth and power. I mean, every yeah. temptation known to man, and some that aren't. Well, the girls I'm brought him right down. You every day. It was women that brought him sure. down. It was. So, the, I mean, he he got hooked up with the wrong I, woman, I, and boom. I have a soft spot for. You know, I have a soft spot for his failings because they're the failings of a man, but the spirit was of a man that really wanted God and and just yeah. got lost with inside that body. I think that's and, and great. That, that happens to so many of us. It's great to have that there in the Bible, though. To have that, you know, again for a learning. Yes, it is. You know, and it's great to see how then he recovered. Had repented, and he lost his kingdom, but then he 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 became the wisest man of all, writing one of the wisest books of all time, Ecclesiastes, which I think when people say wisdom, Dasha, move. When people say wisdom, when people say wisdom, they think of Ecclesiastes, they think of Proverbs. Yes. 
and I do. That's that's where I go. So, uh, thank God for him. And I, I've I met people who want him thrown out of the Bible along with oh, David. I do. They want Solomon tossed out because uh, he uh. he's he's got no place with in Jesus. They want uh, they want uh, they want Paul thrown out as an antichrist, and uh, they want to keep Peter though. I mean, and it's like if well, if I start reducing yeah. every everyone that they don't like in the Bible, we wind up with like you know a very small book of people that they approve of. Yes. See, this the is Bible where the Bible was written. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, it was written by broken men for broken men. You know, if if you look in the Bible. Uh, David, Moses, and Paul are three of the main characters. David and Moses were murderers, and Paul was an accessory to murder. <laughs> so they were not holy men. I think Paul was a murderer too, but you, so uh, I think Paul was a murderer too, but you just didn't see it. Well, he held the coat while they stoned Stephen, so he was at least an accessory to murder, and and he may well have been a murderer. So I mean, you've got sure. three murderers who's three of the most important men in, in in the Word of God. So that should tell you right now that, like I said, God doesn't choose holy men. Uh, yeah. Wicked men become holy because of the power of God, and then they write what they see in the Spirit. That's what happens. Well, um, that's right. And that's what's so amazing. Well, my friend, how about, uh, would you care to have a communion today with our Lord? Yes, I think that would be fantastic. And Trish will uh, join us too. She's not on a mic, I, but uh, we're going to celebrate Christmas. Dasha's here too. She won't leave me alone. And uh, that's fine. She's always going to be a baby because I've babied her, you see. So I got this big German shepherd that scares everybody to death. But to me, she's a baby. <laughs> My pet lion. You know. So, okay, well, <laughs> shall we proceed? She looks like a sweetheart. She's it, but she's fierce. She scares the FedEx people and the, you know, the mailman and, you know, yeah. they, they don't want to come up here anymore because, because unless I can, you know, and I try to teach her, you know, but she has an instinct to just run, you know, up to the truck if it comes up here <laughs> and bark like crazy. And she yeah. looks really fierce and scary though. She's just a puppy still. Um, and yeah. then I, I tell, <laughs> I tell her to come in and she comes right back in, you know, she's, but her instinct is to bark and raise a ruckus, and um, and she does, and that's what I pay her for. <laughs> that's how she gets the big bucks, because she protects us and you know protect, protects the house, and that's why I have a German Shepherd, you know, pretty much like a police dog, as opposed to having a um, yeah. Chihuahua. A Chihuahua is kind of a fun little dog to play with, yeah. <laughs> but the Chihuahua is not going to help me. You know, I need a. I need help. No. I got two fierce, two fierce watchdogs yeah. here, and uh, people say, "Why do you have those?" It's like you know what? I have no regrets. I know that they scare people. I no. don't want to scare them, but I just feel like if someone's coming from afar off, and Dasha has these ears that are just unbelievable, and I get a warning, you know, they're coming from afar off, then I'm ready. Yes. And so Dasha helps me to remain vigilant. And she doesn't drink, you know, martinis or, you know, wine or anything. So she's no. always she's always no, she's on always on guard. Right, she's always she's on always guard. There. Right. Yep. So, so anyway, here we are uh, together having a celebration of Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ. The the the. I mean, there's so much about that that Jesus comes into the world, the light, the true light that it says in the first chapter of John, and that the world cannot comprehend. The light that is actually life of us, it's our life. Life actually comes into the world and says, okay, here's life. Who wants it? And it's, it's really, you kind of admit, that's a huge event upon the earth for God to come in here in the flesh. I mean... It is the greatest single event that has ever happened upon the earth. Yeah? Uh, there could be no other event uh, of any... What should I say? They, they could compare uh, in any way. This was the eternal intersecting with our timeline. Mm -hmm. This was that moment of the eternal now. That's what it was. That's what we are commemorating on this day. That intersection wow. where God actually came within our life in order to restore life to his whole creation. Not just to us, but to all of it. All of creation is waiting for him. 
you know, before creation began, before there was a creation, there mm-hmm. was a creation in God's mind, and it was in unity with God, and it vibrated, it resonated the very breath of God back and forth within him. And as the Son of God took that resonance and spoke it aloud in the song of creation, he brought life into everything, and everything in life is meant to be created with God. The trees sing, the rocks sing, all of life sings. Only man has walked away. And when we come back with God, we come back into that voice of God. That's where the music comes from, out of you. It's yeah. not you. No. It's God and that spirit. You're giving back to God that vibration of life that he put into creation. And that's the breathing back and forth. Respiration. Respiration is life. And that's it. And that's what we're celebrating today, is that vital living respiration between God and man. Yes. Amen. I, you know. Well, I just want to say that um, as we come uh, before the Lord, he says, well, you know, and this is a lot of people misunderstand this. Says, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And um, we see that as like breathing. Inhale, exhale. Yahweh, mm-hmm. right? Yahweh. Or yes. Yahweh. And you know, this whole creation does that. And and it's our it, Lord like, said, if the people didn't cheer, and he walked into Beth, Jerusalem, that the very rocks would shout. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, they recognized who was there. You know, so, life is invested in all of creation. All of creation responds to the living God. It does. So let it, us. It's a simple, natural. Let it. Let us go ahead then, and if if you all out there have your, I, I will warn. On the title, I will warn to have your bread and your little wine or whatever you have, a cracker. I say we uh, we go ahead and have this communion, and let's give them some okay. silent, a time of silence here, so people can. If you need to get ready, you need to okay. stop the podcast. You can do that, but let's have a time of silent. I always like to have a silent prayer. And then go ahead and have our... Yes. But let me... Our, are you let ready? Let me say this before we go there. Okay. You know, in my walk with God, and in your walk with God, we know that there is always, all the time, an invasion of God into this world, into our lives. It is a continuum. It's, a, it's that respiration, that breathing. He is pushing all the time. But this day, we talk about the invasion of God, that eternal intersection with time and as we partake of him today we partake of that invasion of that single solitary moment where all worlds the eternal and the temporal came together in the presence yeah. of one man that small child he came to feed us that we might feed off of him which is what we will do today okay all right, so folks, let's have our moment of silence now and silent prayer. Yes. I like to think of how many things I'm grateful for, and I like to think that our hearts will be open for this. So now yes, let's have that silence. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. Amen. Okay, so let us uh, be brethren together, brethren and sistren, and let's share our bread. And I'm going to share this here, break this for Trish. Trish, you have yours. And let us take the bread, the body of Jesus, as we celebrate the life and birth of Jesus Christ. Now, you have your wine there. Let us.
drink to the Lord here. If we drink, yes, we're drinking the blood of Christ symbolically because we are celebrating life, the Christ within us. Let us drink. Wow. I don't know what to say. (laughs) I don't know what to say. I feel pretty. I love celebrating with him. I feel, wow, I can't even put it into words. It's amazing. It's life, Sam. It's life. Well, this, this wine is actually so good that it's been sitting around. I thought it would be turned, <laughs> to, turned to vinegar by now. And it just it tasted like one, no wine I've ever had before. That's amazing. It's Maybe so, he touched the wine. Of course he touched the wine. It's, it's got to be that. It, it had a, yes. a, like an, an effervescence, not an effervescence, but a kind of expansion of taste that I, I, well, anyway, so we're expanding here, right? What a wonderful way to have Christmas morning, listening to you guys talk and then having communion. Amen. I love it. It's been great. It has really been great. It has, uh, uh, I think when we talk, sometimes we just feed off of each other. It just, it's, you know, and, and, and I love that aspect of it. It, 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 it perks me up, you know, I'll be, I'll be dancing on air for hours. <laughs> me too. And, I, and I'm going to... I'm a well, little fool anyway. <laughs> the Lord is bringing me into talking um, more here with, you know, reaching out to you. And then I'm going to reach out to Brother Thomas here in a minute. I, I, you know, don't don't warn him. <laughs> He'll just get a call in <laughs> the middle of nowhere. Hey, and, thank you, Brother Thomas, for the wonderful Christmas gift. Yes. That, that yesterday. Yes. Really nice. So he's out there and we need to talk to him. Of course, you know... He is, as far as how it went with the United States and the, the whole communist thing and all this stuff, you know, what's so amazing about him is, of course, they don't, they don't uh, follow him. They follow false prophets. But no. he, he, he's been, I mean, if you were to take a truth meter to this guy, it's like, has he ever not batted a thousand? <laughs> you know, and he can't. No, he, he's been right on the money. And nobody seems to even recognize that he's there. And I'm like, this is perfect. But yet we all know about all the other predictors making all their pontifications and predictions and gyrations that are always false. And uh, my friend put it to me this way. He said, Zeph, they hate it when you tell the truth and they love it when you lie. And I'm like, well, then that's something that the Lord has got to straighten out then because that's not right. That's not right at all. It's all a part of the delusion, Zeph. They, they want to hear what they want to hear. They want their ears tickled, as Paul would say. They don't want to hear the truth. Uh, they might tell you they want to hear the truth. They might even think they want to hear the truth. But as soon as the truth comes at them and hits them square in the face, they run from it. Yeah. So they really don't want to hear it. Uh, they're not ready for it. You can't, you can't just say, I'm ready for the truth and, and, and get it. You know, mm-hmm. God has to do some work within you to make you even think that there is a truth. The natural man doesn't think beyond his belly uh, or, or the other organ that's True. a little bit lower than that. You know, that's, that's all as far as he thinks for the most part. Well, you put those two things. He any truth beyond that. Yeah, you put those two things together and it's kind of overwhelming. What's over- that? You put those two things together, it's kind of overwhelming. <laughs> I mean, just think. Yes. I mean, I mean fighting that uh, force, the only way you can do that is you need God, which is the stronger force than all of them that pulls you along. And then you kind of leave that behind, you know, mm-hmm. but, it, but it's, it's, um, yes. Uh, yes. you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's amazing. Well, my brother, I, I so appreciate you being here today and I so appreciate you out there being there today. You're getting a, a pod earlier folks that you probably listened to some of that already. Now you're going to get this one and may we just say, you know, praise God and, and, and praise God for the birth of his son, Jesus Christ upon the earth. What a special, incredible Great event. Time. We've celebrated it today. I hope you celebrate it out there with us. Uh, for Kanita and Trish and everybody else, it's Zeph Daniel, the Zeph Report. We're going to sign off now. And may you just be blessed, you know, the, the rest of the weekend. And uh, may your fears and troubles be put to the side for now. And may you truly have rest. You know, really rest, everybody. I hope we all get some rest. And um, thank you so much for being here, Kanita. And uh, he's Kanita's Ramble on uh, Spreaker at Spreaker.com. Kanita, C-U-N-N-E-D-A, Kanita. And uh, his name is, first name is Charles, but he goes by Kanita and Kanita's Ramble. We just call him Kanita. 
We call him Charles once in a while too, but uh, mm-hmm. I prefer to call you Kanita here because then it reminds people, you know, if they need to get to you, they 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 remember that name. And uh, okay, so sure. Truth of it is, they can call me anything except late for dinner. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all going to have our celebrations today, and may your hearts all be open still with that Christmas spirit. That is something that I do not eschew, and I hope that the people who have listened to the podcast earlier in this today really understand about Christ in Christmas and whatever the dates are and understand the external and legalistic versus the internal, the heart.